Welcome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the good life. Yes. Well, have you ever wanted to give up? Did Throw you? Throw in the towel? Yes, I have before. Oh. <laughs> Thank the Lord I didn't. <laughs> We're going to talk about perseverance today, but you need to hear our guest because you may just change your mind about giving up. You probably will. You know, a lot of times I thought I'll just give up, but it was a fleeting moment. <laughs> And I got back into reality and thought, this Christian life is not to give up. And we're, we've got a wonderful guest, Doug Gaiman, and they're going to be talking yes. about his life and what he does for global international ministries. And we've got great music by Kenny Hope. Uh, and we're going to start the program with Ken singing alive. I was dead in my transgressions, wandering in sin. I went searching for redemption down a road that had no end. I was walking through this fire. I was living on the run with my flesh lost in desire. I was drowning in the flood, but God, rich in mercy, you came to save. I am far from being perfect. There are days that I regret. On this battlefield, I struggle with the lies that I have lived. I have fallen short of glory. I can't make it on my own. But you came reckoning my past. I'd be sinking like a stone, but God. Rich in mercy, you came to save me. Now I'm alive, yes. But God, strong and mighty, you reached out for me so I could rise. Now I'm breathing in for oh. Save me now. I'm alive, my God. Strong and mighty, you reached down for me so I could rise. Now I'm breathing in, oh, I'm breathing out. I was in the grave, but God, you called. Yes. And good music. And alive. That's what we're talking about today. Being alive in Christ. And our guest is a wonderful, wonderful man that knows what it is to never say never <laughs> and not give up. Absolutely. So Welcome. I'd like to share a little bit about you. 
Doug, our guest, Doug, Doug Gaiman, and his wife, Beth, have ministered in nearly 60 nations. That's almost hard to comprehend. He has a master's and a doctorate in missions from Liberty Christian University in Pensacola, Florida. Since 1994, Doug has served with Globe International, a mission sending agency, and became director in 2001 and president in 2004. Mm -hmm. You have four children with your wife, Beth, and you all have 11 grandchildren. My, right. my, I thought we had a lot of grandchildren. <laughs> Don't say that. We've got almost that many. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So welcome. Thank you. It's a delight to be here with you today. <laughs> well, we we get right into the book, and we need to show the book. But it's before you quit. So that means everybody has thoughts of quitting. Oh, I think that's true. At some time. Oh, yeah. So before you quit, before you actually take that step, God has got something better for you. Mm -hmm. And right. this book is a wonderful read. Uh, yes, it is. You would think that it would be easy, just one page, say, before you quit, uh, don't quit. But this is a wonderful story, not a story, it's accounts of people who were at the brink of quitting and God got a hold of them. Now, we're talking about a missionary you say, do missionaries quit? I didn't know that. <laughs> well, they do, and they, there's many of them, hundreds of them, thousands of them that have quit. Oh, yes. Or felt like or it. Or felt like it, yeah. <laughs> well, you share in the very beginning of your book the most wonderful story, and you were only 27 years old, and this, seeing this missionary, I've just said WC, that's mm -hmm. what you called that's him in the right. book. Uh -huh. But you saw something in him that made you decide perseverance is very important. Mm -hmm. What if you not persevered? Would you share that story? Sure. Uh, well, WC, we worked for him for about three years uh, when we were a young family, one child, another one on the way when we started working with him and he had a vision to preach the gospel in Southeast Asia to tens of thousands of people. He had had some previous missions experience in Indonesia. They had gone through a tough time for several years. They lost their second child there from uh, um, like a complication of pneumonia. So they went home grieving, of course you can imagine, and then they their church sent them back to India to work with an evangelist in India that had been preaching the gospel to large, you know, events, thousands, tens of thousands of people. And he worked with that, that evangelist named Ray Jennings for about a year. That experience transformed WC's life and he got a vision to do the same in other countries besides India. So he moved his family back to Southeast Asia and just by an odd happenstance, I met him when he was just launching this new vision. He was living in Hong Kong, and I was on my way for my second trip to Asia to Hong Kong. And uh, one of our leaders in our church said, hey, while you're in Hong Kong, you should look this guy up. He knew him from some background. <clears throat> so I wrote him a letter. That was back in the days when there wasn't any email. You know, <laughs> cell phones didn't exist. This was in the uh, late 70s. <laughs> and uh, wrote him a letter and he said yeah I'd love to meet you but he said the problem is you're coming to Hong Kong and I'm leaving like the day you arrive to go to to Thailand to, to do uh, launch a new ministry but if you want to I could use some help and why don't you come with me and you were so only 27 right? I was younger than 27 oh. that was 1978 so I was 23 yeah mm -hmm. so I was you were young I was a boy <laughs> <laughs> I had a, a wife and a baby <clears throat> so I, he said, if you want to come with me, well, I was going with another group, and they had about 30 people. So I thought, they don't really need me. I'm just going to be an extra. Um, and he needed help, and I wanted to be useful. So I called the other group, and I said, I think I'm going to do a different direction, and they were good with that. 
I met uh, WC at the airport in Hong Kong and uh, we stayed there a couple days and then we flew on his first, my first trip to Thailand. He left me at the hotel and he uh, goes and meets with this group of leaders, some Thai pastors and some uh, uh, missionaries about his vision to preach the gospel uh, to large crowds. Well, he came back from that meeting. They had all discouraged him. They all said, no, this is a Buddhist country. Nobody will come to a Christian meeting here. Uh, the best you can hope for is maybe a hundred people, you know, and he, he kind of stomps back in his own way to the to the hotel and vents on me or vents to me about their lack of faith and use some colorful language and <laughs> not off color but just yeah. you know about how God's going to do something amazing in this country despite their unbelief and and I'm sitting there you know what did I know <laughs> I was an intern I'm like okay <laughs> well we started he bought this little white van. Uh, uh, it was old when he bought it, uh, and it was falling apart when he bought it. He bought it in Hong Kong, and he shipped it to Thailand. I think Tell him what you named it. Yeah, it was. <laughs> we named it Lazarus. My wife, I have to give her the credit oh, for that. So she had a good way of naming cars, and this this thing just kept dying, and we kept having to raise it from the dead <laughs> to keep it going. And so she said, "This is Lazarus. We're going to drive Lazarus." We'd, we'd pile Lazarus full of people and equipment and suitcases and drove that thing all over the country for the next two and a half, three years uh, to, and preaching in little meetings in little villages and dusty places. I joked to one friend of mine, I said, I feel like sometimes we're preaching to more dogs and chickens than we are to human right. beings. The dogs would walk in, you know, in the middle of the meeting and stand in the front with an empty area. And we're on this on this little platform we build and they turn their ear at us, you know, and they, they walk <laughs> off. And it was like over and over again along this dusty road of forgotten places. We preached the gospel to measly crowds, proving to the naysayers and the unbelievers that they actually were right. <laughs> And I, I watched W.C. during this time, you know, in his prayer life, in his determination, in his, uh, we had very little money, you know, trying to keep Lazarus alive and living in little places um, that were dirty and unkept. And, um, and I saw this determination in him, you know, and often I wondered, is it worth doing this? And is he is he crazy for believing what he's believing? He's praying for tens of thousands to come to his meetings. <clears throat> well, April of 1981 was our last meeting before our commitment was finished to the team. It was a small team. Um, our, our commitment was finished. He and his wife and, and their daughters were going back to the U.S. We're all going back to the U.S. for some itineration. We go up into the north of Thailand, this little village, and when we got there, he said, he said, I don't know why we agreed to a 10-day meeting here. He said, this place is so small, we could have done a three or four day meeting and, and done enough. So we set up our stuff, we set up camp in an old school because there was no place to stay. And we, we ran a light bulb from a neighbor's house to, to into this school. There were three rooms in the school, so our family was in one, WC was in another, and the Thai, Thai team that we were with uh, we're in the third, and my wife wouldn't let me turn the light off at night because the rats were running in the, in the rafters, and she was afraid that they'd come down and bite our two children by then. We had our two. I mean, you're talking about camping out. Yes. <clears throat> we had to dig holes in the ground to, for a toilet. We had to make little bamboo, you know, shelters and take a bath out of a 55-gallon drum. I mean, we were camping out. <laughs> First night, 300 people showed up, which was a surprise because that was the biggest crowd we'd probably seen in two years. Mm. Second night, 600 people showed up. We did exactly Amazing. what we'd done the same, always before. The third night, it was over 1,200. I'm kind of rounding the numbers out, but basically the crowd started doubling. 1,200, 2,400, 5,000, 8,000, 10,000. By the ninth night, 20,000 people were on that field. Wow. Yeah. wow. And somewhere around the fifth or sixth night, trucks started coming in at three in the afternoon and dropping off a load of people, like a dump truck. <laughs> they weren't dump trucks, <laughs> but that's how it looked because they all rolled off the back, you know. Little old ladies, teenagers, kids, mamas with children, field workers. Three in the afternoon, they'd come up and sit in front of the platform 
and put newspaper over their head because this is hot tropical sun and sit there for three hours waiting for the meeting to start. Mm. Um, at nights, amazing. hundreds refused to leave. They, the, the, the school we were staying in was built on stilts, like the Thai, old Thai style, so it was like four or five feet off the ground. Hundreds of people moved in underneath where we were sleeping to get sh have shelter in case it might rain. They stayed on the field. Many other thousands, of course, left. Um, so that twenty, that that ninth night, twenty thousand people. Uh, we lost our permit the next day because some, some of the local, you know, powers that be weren't happy with this Christian meeting going on, mm -hmm. preaching the gospel about Jesus Christ. Um, but the fall, the last night, still sixteen thousand people showed up. And WC got Amazing. up in front of them, turned the mic on, and said, we can't have a meeting tonight, uh, so, you know, we're going to send you home early. He was very respectful, you know, the authorities, but he said, but I will pray for anybody who wants prayer. And I watched him sit on a little chair, a little plastic chair on that stage as a crowd, I, I think it was 16,000 people, I don't know, up one stairs, get a p little short prayer from him and down the other. And I watched in awe of, of him pray for these people that he loved and prayed for so for three years. And I made a note in my heart, I said, you know, if he had quit, if yes. he had quit and given in to the discouragement and the disappointments and the dust and the dirt and the lack of money and the naysayers, he would not have arrived at that moment. That's right. That's right. He would have missed that moment. That wouldn't have happened. And I tucked that away and said, man, that is a lesson to learn. God has a destiny, he has a plan, and we have to be willing to push through some obstacles and some disappointments and some stuff along the way. And it took you 30 years to write that in a book. <laughs> yeah, it did. I, was, I had to go through my own, you know, I had to go through my own disappointments. I remember I tucked away in my mind three years. It took three years. Maybe that's all it'll take me when I launch my own ministry. It actually took us about four and a half till we hit pay dirt. <laughs> and I remember that last year, year and a half before we went from struggling to fruitfulness, I thought God had abandoned me, you know. Um, we were dealing with problems, the same kind of things, because we lost, launched a similar ministry in, uh, in another country. And uh, I thought the Lord had forgotten about us. We were dealing with rain. So many of our events were rained out. And, you know, rain is the enemy of an outdoor event. Oh, yeah. yes. uh, it's, that is true today. You pray it won't rain, you know. And it just rained over and over. Our events were raining out. And I said, Lord, I'm spending all this money and all this effort and all this praying and fasting and seeking you for these people, you know, you, you almost feel like you shouldn't ask, you know, because you know it's not true, <laughs> but it's like you feel like, don't you care? You know, do I care more than you do? What am I missing, you know? So he was growing you up. <laughs> that's exactly right, Bob. He was growing me up. He was, you know, one of the things about perseverance is it proves how much you believe in something. Yeah. Uh, it, it proves how much you want something. Well, what influenced you to even write this book? Well, I have to give Moody Publishers the credit for that. Um, I spoke at a conference in June of 2018 in Chicago, um, organized by Ed Stetzer, the Amplify Conference. I was there doing a workshop with, uh, we're, we have an affiliation with the Luis Palau Association. He wrote the foreword to mm -hmm. my book. Yes. <clears throat> so they opened this door for me to do this workshop. It wasn't on perseverance, it was on organizational development, you know, board board work, because I'm kind of known to do some of that stuff too. And uh, so I did this workshop and uh, had a lot of people get with me afterwards, wanted to talk, ask questions about their organizations. And there was one uh, young man hovering in the back and I kept looking back there, you know, saying, you've been waiting a long time, do you have a question? And he said, no, I'm good, you know. And uh, so after about an hour, we had to move out into the hallway because the room we were in, the large, event room was needed and so we moved in the hallway. Finally, it was his turn. He was the only guy left and I said, can I help you? And I, you have a question? He said, well, he said, my name is Dwayne Sherman. I work for Moody Publishers and I'd like to talk to you about writing your next book. <laughs> <laughs> I'd already written three and he had figured that out, you know, by looking at me online and reading my blog and so I said, oh, well, what do you want me to write about? He said, 
Do you have an hour? Let's go talk, and I'd like to talk to you about that. So in his acquisition editorial skills, he pulled it out of me. And yeah. at the end of it, he said, you know, you need to write a book about perseverance. He said, that's yeah. part of your story that hasn't been written. Absolutely. And so Moody, he and Moody just coached me towards this book proposal, and here we are. Well, and we're so glad you wrote this book, and you're going to be blessed if you stay tuned, but right now we're going to take a break. Because we've got some <laughs> more stories that you That's just right. wouldn't believe. So if you're ready to quit, put it on the shelf. <laughs> Don't quit. Just persevere a little longer. We'll be right back. Kenny's going to sing for us, and we'll be back with... Um, our dear friend from Pensacola, Florida. Uh, God bless you, and we'll be right back. next text could save a life. Help CTN bring hope to the hurting, feed the hungry, and reach the lost. You can make a difference today. Text CTN HOPE to 206-859-9405. That's CTN HOPE to 206-859-9405. Open the scroll, 
the Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. talking to Doug Gaiman about missions, really, but it's more than that. It's what you do with your life, and, and I guess that is missions, really, what you do with your life. And before you quit, there's some lessons to be learned. Yes. And I don't know where that book is available, I guess, on Amazon mm -hmm. and every place you can get the book. But I wanted to talk to you about perseverance and why does a person need to have that kind of an outlook on life? I'm going to persevere until we win. Yeah. Well, uh, perseverance, number one, the very definition of perseverance is it's not fun anymore. You know, it hurts. <laughs> something hurts. And we hurt because we've lost something. So in the book, I talk about four different areas of loss. It's either uh, time is lost, uh, fun, meaning the enjoyment of something is now lost, uh, or something of our treasure, some, either it's money or something that we highly value is now gone or, or is depleting, or a relationship. One of those four areas of our, of our lives, we suffer, we're suffering loss, and perseverance is the issue, the, the principle that we now are confronted with. Am I going to quit because I've lost this thing that I value, because I'm holding on for something I don't yet have? Uh, what do I do in the interim when you're in pain, when you're not happy, when you're suffering? That's what perseverance is. It, it's by definition is it's not fun anymore. Uh, and that, of course, is a test of what are you reaching for? What are you hoping for? How much do you believe in that which you're striving for or waiting for or, or hoping for? How much do you want that? You know, if it's an ambition, even a Christ-centered ambition like W.C., he had a vision to preach to tens of thousands of people. Well, he didn't have that on the first day or even the first year. It took several years before he realized that dream. So what does he do in the interim? That's what perseverance is. Amen. Yeah. Well, you name three different kinds of perseverance. So would you talk about those? Yeah, it was interesting uh, when I began to lay the book out and start to do some research on it, both in scripture as well as the writings of others. I had this epiphany like, wow, there's different kinds of perseverance. I never thought of it. You know, it's all just one flavor. It's not fun. <laughs> yeah. But there are actually different kinds. Uh, the first one I call everyday endurance. Uh, 
Uh, that's the type of things that we all deal with in our daily lives that are aggravating. Uh, stuck in traffic, stuck behind a long line at the supermarket and someone who's fumbling with their cash or their checkbook. Um, rained out birthday parties, you know, just things that aggravate us. They're not life changing. Often it's the loss of, of time. Sometimes it's a loss of revenue, like this trip. I was delayed on, on my flight on the way here. Then on the return flight, it initially was canceled, you know, so I had to figure out how am I going to make that work to get back to other, other. so it's, it's time, it's revenue. Everyday endurance impinges on our sense of entitlement. We feel like, in, especially in Western culture, things are supposed to go well for us. You know, we're pretty organized and we have a lot of technology. So we don't do well with everyday endurance. We get impatient. The second kind of, of perseverance is what I call aspirations for greatness. And that is something we voluntarily enter into. Uh, I decided a few years ago to run a marathon. Well, I'd never done that before. And all my friends who had done it, they said, you know, marathons by definition are painful. <laughs> you're not going to do a marathon. You're not going to run 26.2 miles without some pain. So just get ready. So you train, you train, you change your eating habits, you change your training habits. You're all this investment of time and energy in order to become greater at something, to accomplish something you've never done before. So aspirations for greatness are things that we enter into, and it takes grit. What Angela Duckworth, the, the author of a book called Grit, she calls that grit. W.C. had a lot of grit. He just, he wanted something. He aspired to something great. It was for the glory of God, but he, it was still something great. It was something outside of his reality. <clears throat> the third kind of perseverance is what I called moral courage, and that is where we are asked by God to do something that is involuntary, uh, a loss of a loved one, uh, a failure of a marriage, a failure of a business, a terminal illness. Uh, and the outcome of this, of this difficulty is not certain. Uh, we, we might be healed. A relationship might be uh, restored. Uh, but we don't know. We just have to walk it out. When Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, you know, he aspired to becoming the head of his family. You know, he had these dreams that he would become the head of his family. Well, then he got sold into slavery, and then he got accused of immorality, you know, he, and then he was delayed in prison because the butler and the baker forgot about it. I mean, this, this guy, he was asked by God to hold on to his faith in God without an, a certain outcome. Um, we all go, at one point or another in our lives, we have to have moral courage. We go through something we can't control. Something happens to us that, out, that is out of our control. And we have yeah. to make a decision. Are we going to trust God in this uncertainty and an uncertain outcome? It might turn out good, but we could die. I mean, Hebrews 11 talks about those who would not give up their faith even though they died. Yeah. Well, you know, you talked about David Mayo, and of course we know David Mayo because he's the manager yes. of the CTN station in Pensacola. Right. But you said some nice things about him, and we just totally agreed. We love David. But would you just share with our audience what you shared in the book? Yes. So David, you know, he's, on, he's a dear friend of mine, him and his wife Beverly. Uh, they're on the Globe board. They're manager of one of the CTN stations in Pensacola. And so I, I wanted to tell his story in... Uh, in this book because it's about perseverance and yet I didn't know all the details so I took David out for breakfast one day and I said okay now you got to tell me your story <laughs> uh, to his credit David never makes things about him you know but he's happy to tell it when asked so he was a 15 year old teenager and he went on a climbing uh, outing with his we well, went on a, a camping outing yeah. with his family <clears throat> and he went up by himself and tried to climb a rock climb and he fell and fell like 35 feet and landed on his back, broke his back, um, and so waited for hours till they came looking for him. And ultimately, the result of that accident was he was confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. 
Well, you can imagine for a 15-year-old kid coming to terms with that yes. new reality. How I mean, I can't imagine how hard that would be yeah. to come to terms with that. A young, you know, excited about life, very outgoing, very athletic, very active, now confined to a wheelchair. So that in itself was a, a message of perseverance, an experience of perseverance for how to overcome the confines of a wheelchair, how to be autonomous on one hand and yet ask for help on another and all these things. And now, you know, today David's in middle age and he lives this imperfect life. You know, we all live an imperfect life. You know, we all have things about us that aren't everything we wish they were. And he, he uh, I, I brag about David because I say he rides faster than me, he plays tennis <laughs> better than me, he swims, tri swims and does triathlons quicker than me, you know. And we, we banter about it in a competitive kind of way when we're together, but we never feel like it's competition because we're just friends. But the amazing thing about it is he sits down for everything he does. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, so he, to me, is a shining example of a person who's come to terms with something he couldn't control. Yeah, and that, I think, goes back also to his faith. Yes. Uh, his faith is so strong. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, if I wanted someone to pray for me, I'd ask David to pray. Mm -hmm. um, because he knows God is able. Mm -hmm. Because he's been able to do all these things. And yet, he's still in a wheelchair. Yep. And I thought for a long time, well, just one day we're going to hear he's walking again. Yeah. But that never happens. Yet. But yet. But he knows that God is able. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Well, I think that's, that is what, that is really the defining characteristic of our Christian faith. Um, if you compare our Christian faith with the world system, um, you know, the world system is very temporally focused. We get about 87 and a half years, is what scientists, you know, tell us about Americans, get about on average, and then you're gone. Yep. Uh, which is ironic, you know, in the naturalist view of billions and billions of years, you know, the human life is just a wisp. It's just, it's nothing. Um, as a Christian, though, we, we believe that underneath everything that undergirds our faith is life is eternal. You know, we have an eternity out in front of us mm -hmm. that is never ending. God designed human beings to be eternal when he breathed in us the breath of life, Adam and Eve. He gave, gave us life, created humanity. And as Christians, we believe life goes on and we look forward to being with Jesus in heaven for eternity. Hebrews 11, the great chapter on faith, basically is based in that underlying assumption these, these folks in Hebrews were willing to endure difficulty because they saw something. If you look at Hebrews, often it's not emphasized in Hebrews, but it's, they looked for something that they didn't have. Yeah. Abraham looked for a city. You know, they looked for something that's far off. They, Noah looked for something that was a, a, a better life, you know, beyond. Uh, they all were looking for something. And if you really think about it, all of us as Christians are looking for something that transcends yeah our temporal human life. And that's what we go back to when something in our temporal human life goes awry. We hang on to that which is eternal. Yes. And, and that's what keeps us going. I know for myself, when, when our, our family went through some difficult times, and I talk about some of those in the book. And would you share some right now? Yeah, well, one of the big one, one of the big one was my brother. When I was 29, we were serving in Asia as missionaries. My brother was in California, and he took his own life. Um, he was a part of Jack Hayford's church in in Southern California, and it had nothing to do with the church. It was just stuff he was going through. But the the church on the way was hugely uh, supportive of our family during that time, and it was just a shock to us because Dale was serving the Lord, but then he went into a, a terrible depression and he ended up killing himself. We were in Thailand, we came home, and I remember flying home on the airplane just with this sorrow, overwhelming sorrow of the loss of my brother. And I remember the Lord just kind of nudged me uh, from the, the scripture in Isaiah 53 where it says that Jesus, uh, prophetically of Jesus, as 
Isaiah's suffering servant, the theologians call him. It says, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And I thought, now I'm acquainted with grief. <laughs> I don't want to be acquainted with grief. But it came knocking on my door and I had to let him in, you know. And I, and I had this insight about the person of Christ, that what the incarnation really means is it means that God got involved with broken humanity and he felt and experienced what we experience in our brokenness, in our pains, and in our grief. He became a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And over the years as I've pondered that loss, I've, I've now seen that God, through, even through a tragedy that we have to believe didn't have to happen, God in his sovereignty gave us a gift. He gave us yeah. a gift of understanding what, what Jesus, who Jesus is, you know. He, the incarnation is about God who doesn't need anything and doesn't have any suffering is willing to suffer for us. And I said, Lord, I, I want to be that kind of person. I want to be a, a Christ-like person that's willing mm -hmm. to suffer with others. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that has an eternal <clears throat> quality to it because we do that in, why? So that others can come, come with us to heaven. You know, Amen. To win that's them. Right. Yeah. Amen. Well, we're going to take Good a break answer. and... Uh, more music by Kenny Hope, but we'll be right back, so you stay with us. And the Lord impressed on this man that at some time there was going to be a beacon sitting on this property. As a matter of fact, I believe that that's how Florida Beacon College got its name. And it is incredible that all of these years, this man's been so disappointed because there's no beacon here. And sitting back behind you, you'll notice a, a tower that's sitting back there. I don't know, it's by the red car behind that. As you go out, you'll notice it. That tower has been laying out there, not being used for anything. It's just been, somebody donated it to the, to the college, and I guess that at one time they were figuring, well, maybe they would build a radio station or something with it, but it's been laying there. And God put all of this together for what we're about to do here at Channel 22 because that tower is going to be erected someplace right here on this property with a beacon on top of it. Death has lost its grip on me. 
that good music. Well, it's time for We the People. Now, the We the People will keep you informed about our nation's Christianity. It'll keep you informed about how we should live, how we could live. Not about little things that happen, but all together, things that we need to do. Here's the our edition of We the People. <laughs> There are thousands of documents that prove the truth of the Christian founding of our country. Today we're traveling back to 1776 and the original Continental Congress. They assigned a committee to come up with a new seal for the new United States. They asked Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams to come up with a design. There were a couple of initial drafts, so let's look at the one designed by Benjamin Franklin. Many people claim that Franklin despised Christianity and was a deist. So with that in mind, our trivia question is this. What was Franklin's design for the seal? A, a little pair of bifocal glasses. B, a kite in an electrical storm. C, a giant turkey with a musket. Or D, Moses parted the Red Sea. Of course, the answer is D. Benjamin Franklin chose to include the parting of the Red Sea from the Bible in the seal of the United States. Here is the exact description. Moses standing on the shore and extending his hand over the sea 
thereby causing the same to overwhelm Pharaoh, who is sitting in an open chariot, a crown on his head and a sword in his hand, raised from a pillar of fire in the clouds, reaching to Moses to express that he acts by command of the deity. That is a fact. Not only that, here's another question. What was the motto that he recommended? A, in ourselves we trust. B, bald on top and mullet hair in the back is beautiful. C, electricity is our friend. Or D, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. And of course it's D. This is one of the least religious founders giving all glory to God and the Bible. That is the truth behind our founding. There's even more incredible news and facts on Thomas Jefferson's design, but that's in another We The People episode. You can search for that on ctnonline.com. Our fact today is that Benjamin Franklin designed a seal based on the Bible. If you listen to most people today that have no real grasp on our true history, they'll tell you that Franklin was a deist and didn't want religion anywhere near the government. What we're presenting today is a fact. Franklin's design for the permanent seal of the newly formed United Colonies was based on the Bible. The design was presented to Congress on August 20th, but was tabled for a later decision. And in 1782, they finally came up with a version that's the approved eagle that we still use today. Our historical fact for today is that even Benjamin Franklin wanted the Bible to be forever linked to our country through the national seal. That's the truth behind our early founders, including Christianity in the government. Wow, we oh, learn something that every is time, the don't truth. we? Yes. <laughs> yes. Huh. Well, we want to talk about rest and self-care. You said that is essential. Yes. So, you know, a lot of people wonder, what do I do in this interim period when I'm suffering between the loss that I'm feeling and this holding on to something I'm waiting for? Well, obviously, we have to get up every morning, you know, and, and do our responsibilities. Uh, so as a dad, I had to be a dad and I had to be a husband and I had to fulfill my ministry, you know, got to go to work. Uh, but how do we self-care? Um, so I suggest a few things in the book. One is to read, read the Bible, read, read the works of other good authors. In other words, have an attitude of learning. The second thing is to um, worship, pray. So one is cognitive, learn with your head. The other is more intuitive, let your heart be turned to God. The third thing uh, is create. Um, God's made us all creative. We all have these in, in inherent abilities to make something new. We can't create like God did, something out of nothing, but we can work with our hands, with our ideas and thoughts and skills and crafts. So create. Um, I find that people who learn to have a positive way of expressing their grief do better than people who express their grief with negative behaviors by drug abuse and other forms of addictive behaviors. Um, so create is important. And then the fin final thing I say to people is divert, which basically means change something. You know, quitting doesn't mean you don't change anything. Yeah. Change yeah. something, you know, repent. So. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Amen. Well, I know there are people out there that may not know Jesus like we do. So what would you say to those that say, I'm not born again? Yeah. So what are you all talking about? Well, at the, at the heart of the new birth is a surrender to God. Uh, it's saying, I can't deal with life on my own. I can't do this by myself. And so it's surrendering to God. It's in inviting him to become a part of your life and turning your life over to him. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And you suggest that. Yes, <laughs> I suggest that. Well, Amen. we did it and it worked. Jesus changed our lives, yes. transformed our lives, and he'll do it for you. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and come into your heart and be Lord and Savior. Amen. He will. Amen. Our closing song by Ken Hope, Scares. God bless you. Looking back from the other side I can see now with open eyes 
darkest water and deepest pain. I wouldn't trade it for anything mm, because my brokenness brought me to you. And these wounds are a story you will use. So I'm thankful for the scars, cause without them I wouldn't know your heart. And I know they'll always tell of who you are. So forever I am thankful for the scars. Now I'm standing in confidence with the strength of your faithfulness. And I'm not who I was before. No, I don't have to fear I can see how you delivered me, oh, in your hands, in your feet, I found my victory. I'm thankful for your scars, because without them I wouldn't know your heart. And with my life, I'll tell of who you are. So forever I am thankful, I'm thankful for the scars, cause without them I wouldn't know your heart, and I know they'll always tell of who you are, so forever I am thankful for the scars. Forever I am thankful for the scars. 